the Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, chronologically slowed hero takes on arthritic nemesis, firing time-traveling bullets from last Tuesday and longest action scene ever written. Thanksgiving tummy rumbles lead to Black Friday stampedes. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. This time we have part three of an interview with Dave Massa talking about the new book he's written with John Ringo. This is a continuation of the Black Tide Rising science-based zombie series, and it takes place near the beginning of Ringo's solo series opener, Under a Graveyard Sky. This one involves Tom, the brother of the hero of Under a Graveyard Sky. This book is called The Valley of Shadows, and Mike will tell us much more about it in a moment. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's great high fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword. Now, here's the news. Gobble, gobble, boil and bubble. Have we got some eARCs for your Thanksgiving holidays ready for you? Now, an eARC is the device just under the breastbone the aliens implanted in turkeys thousands of years ago in order to ensure that they could be folded flat when the aliens return for provisions. They, you can just activate it by pressing a button there. If you don't remove it before cooking, you're liable to end up having a two-dimensional Thanksgiving yourself. No, 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 that's not right. That's not what an eARC is. An eARC is something else. It's an electronic advanced reading copy. It's a early edition of a book that you can get as an e in ebook form that is the galley version that is after the copy edit's done but before all the proofreading's done so it's it's kind of like a turkey you take out a little early from the oven but you get it lots earlier to read and out now in eark farm is house of assassins by larry korea hey this is the sequel to son of the black sword the fate of the world lies in the balance Ashok Vidal was once a member of the highest caste in all of Locke. As a protector, he devoted his life to upholding the law, delivering swift justice with his ancestor blade, Agravadal. But then Ashok learned that his life to that point had been a lie. He had been nothing more than an unwitting pawn in a political game. His world turned upside down. He began a campaign of rebellion, war, and destruction, unlike any the continent of Locke had ever seen. And now, first daughter of Vane, Thera is held captive by a shape-shifting wizard with designs on her powers. Ashok Vidal marches to rescue Thera, but it seems Ashok may be caught in a game played by gods for the fate of the world itself. If the gods do exist, Ashok has warned them, stay out of my way. Also out in Eark is the Mangazin Wars 15 Anthology. Created by Larry Niven. You know, the predator cat -like warrior race known as the Gazin never had a hard time dealing with all those they encountered and conquered before. That is, until they came face to face with the leaf eaters known as humans. Small of stature and lacking both claws and fangs, the humans should have been easy prey. But for years now, the humans and the Gazin have been engaged in a series of wars with neither side able to declare decisive victory once and for all. New stories of the war between humanity and the cat-like Kazin from Brad R. Torgerson, Brendan Dubois, Martin L. Shoemaker, and more. Man Kazin Wars 15 e art created by Larry Niven, and House of Assassins e art by Larry Correa are available exclusively at Bain eBooks. Hey, go to Bain.com and get them now. This is the third part of an interview with Mike Massa talking about The Valley of Shadows by John Ringo and Mike Massa. Parts 1 and 2 are available on the previous two weeks' podcasts. I want to welcome Mike Massa to the podcast. Hello, Mike. 
Hi, Tony. How are you doing this evening? Pretty good. Um, Mike Massa has lived a diverse and adventurous life, including stints as a Navy SEAL officer. Yeah. Investment. Yep, yep. No, I'm sorry. I was just giving the traditional uh, SEAL uh, greeting, which is hoo ya. Oh, I see. <laughs> I see. <laughs> An international advance, investment banker. Do they have a call? Uh, yes, it's called Show Me the Money. I see. And an internet technologist. Um, Mike is currently at a university cyber as uh, Mike is currently as a university cybersecurity researcher, consulted by governments, Fortune 500 companies, and high net worth families on issues of privacy, resilience, and disaster recovery. He lives. He has lived outside the U.S. for several years, plus military deployments, and has traveled to over 80 countries. He's the author of a bunch of short stories, and now with John Ringo, the co-author of the Valley of Shadows, a new entry in the Black Tide Rising series. What were you? Um, what did you read, and how did you entertain yourself? And uh, what what does um, somebody with your background who knows a lot about? Um, the kind of stuff that that a lot of readers of this book say will find fascinating. What what other writers do you recommend and that you like? Obviously, you like Ringo. I do. Um, before I read Ringo, uh, the very first science fiction author that I ever read was upon my return to the United States as a in uh, grade school, and I picked up a yellow hardback book without a paper cover that had a picture of a boy riding in the back of what looked like a multi-legged um, um, dinosaur, and it was called Star Beast by Robert Anson Heinlein. And I read that, and I was hooked on the genre, on that author, in 15, 20 pages. And, I, and that began a lifelong, um, to, this affair, love, uh, love, to this day, love affair with science fiction and fantasy, um, and, of course, I read everything I could find, and I rapidly ran out. And I'm like, oh, I'm so disappointed. There's, there's only about a dozen or maybe fewer Heinlein juveniles that I could find. And I was despondent, and the librarian took pity on me and said, you know, there's, there's other Heinleins. I'm like, there are? She goes, yeah. And she walked me over to the adult section and said, I didn't show you this. And then she kind of pointed furtively under her arm, and there on the shelf were things like um, – Gosh, uh, Time Enough for Love, Strange in a Strange Land, Str um, Starship Troopers, I mean, all the, all the huge ones. And then through uh, reading some of his anthologies, I began to identify other authors. But my first, the first Bane author that I ever read was David Drake. And the first thing I read of his was Hammer Slammers, and that blew me away. A very different tone from anything I'd written to that, much more uh, gritty and realistic than sort of the golden age stuff that I've been reading to that point. And immediately I began to devour everything I could find. Um, actually, in a, in a strange twist, about an hour ago I wrapped up a dinner with, um, with other main authors, and I had the privilege and the honor to sit across from Dave and listen to some of the stories, and the man hasn't, hasn't lost a step. He's still a master. Uh, and my favorite novel of his, of course, is, is Redliners, which I came strongly to identify with when I returned home from Somalia, and, uh, and that happened to pick up that novel, and uh, even though he wrote it after a different war, still very much topical. In fact, he and I, he and I talked about how, uh, you know, given where we are right now in our cycle um, of uh, conflict with troops uh, largely filtering home from Afghanistan and Iraq, it's still a highly relevant book. So uh, I'm, yeah. I'm a big fan of, of Bain authors. But I also read outside the, the Bain canon, um, although uh, it probably you – know, I've got everything that Louis McMaster Bouchold has wrote, Luffer stuff. Uh, again, big fan of John Ringo, big fan of Larry Correa. There's too many, there's too many to name, um, really. But uh, suffice to say that our home, and I'm married to a, a fellow uh, bibliophile, my wife Lorna, and my goodness, between the two of us, we have a bookshelf on nearly every wall of our modest home and then boxes and boxes of storage. So our, our dream is to have a house big enough to have all of our books all of our friends out of storage and out on the shelf. <laughs> yeah. I bet your friends are getting a little stuffy in those closets too. <laughs> but, uh... We had to rent them their own apartment in a storage shelter. So the idea of living modestly and having a store, having a separate apartment for your books is not working out for us. We got to, we got to uh, fix this somehow. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, by the way, we have a, uh, 
Got a great uh, big long interview with uh, Dave Drake talking about Redliners um, back there in the podcast archives. If anybody wants to look it up, um, he had a great conversation with him. And we have lots of great Dave interviews, but that's that one is particularly about Redliners. It, it, it is an outstanding book. Um, I would say one of the one of the best in the military science fiction genre, and certainly written by a person who has been there, done that, and lived to tell the tale. And it, it's not so much a story about super violent space age combat. It's about people placed in intolerable stress and what they do to rediscover the, the better angels of their nature and still accomplish the mission. It's a it's a tremendous work that uh, outside of fairly narrow readership, as far as I know, not, not everybody that, I, that I've talked to has heard of it, uh, but it deserves to be more widely read, and I recommend it to all my veteran friends. Yeah, definitely. So tell us a little bit about the banking, too. Um, were you, you were on the security end of things, or what, what were you doing? So I, before, when I, uh, prior to being um, recruited by the bank, to run their intelligence section, I had just sold uh, my share of a small startup that was focused on uh, technology-related security and uh, imagery manipulation, and it was a, a very small niche defense contracting firm um, that uh, that I exited and sort of I liquidated. I had a, it's what we would call a liquidity event. I, I later learned basically you, you find a way to turn your stock into cash and you exit the firm, and that's what I did uh, successfully and. Uh, and, pro- and uh, um, um, it was to my fan- financial benefit. And uh, by about that time, I was contacted by a recruiter who said, we're looking for someone with uh, understanding of both uh, corporate finance, uh, technology, and security, uh, and who has a, a military background that touches on intelligence because we are, we are trying to replace the head of our international intelligence unit or global intelligence unit for our bank. And I said, well, I'm happy to, uh, happy to interview. And I was uh, flown overseas to be interviewed by, the, um, by a number of very senior folks in the bank. And that interview process was protracted, involved uh, two rounds of in-person interviews uh, across the Atlantic and uh, several hours of, of um, pretty rigorous uh, discussion. And it was eventually selected. And uh, my post was the Managing Director for Global Protective Intelligence, which is quite a mouthful. Uh, interestingly, um, that kind of intelligence unit exists at most large multinational corporations because their relationships one-to-one with nations pretty much include law enforcement-related information and intelligence unique to that particular country or region. If you're a multi-region bank with branches or trading operations on, you know, uh, literally all five continents, so to include Australia, you need something that connects all those um, disparate sources of information, and that's what this order, that's what my department did. Uh, later, we had a departure, and I ended up taking on a regional security role that wasn't just intelligence, but it was physical security, executive protection, uh, business continuity, which means how do you keep this place running when you begin to lose essential services or there's a security threat, uh, disaster. Uh, response and crisis management, which is, okay, the bad thing is happening. Uh, how do we respond? How do we protect our people, our processes, our infrastructure, and our information? And then a few other bits and pieces like anti-fraud and what was then beginning to be called cybersecurity. And uh, so it's a very it's a very broad portfolio, and there's so much. Yeah, it's well, what, yeah. well, what, what did you do? Can you give us an example of something that that happened that, I mean, you can file the serial numbers off or whatever. Absolutely, Cher. Uh, so as an example, um, two, two, two significant events that will illustrate what a managing director for intelligence and a regional security or global security director for a bank would do. Um, one was I had, I had the duty and I had to watch, just like anywhere else in a big organization that has 24-7 global operations, there's always somebody – uh, on the phone, always a team of people ready to respond and do what has to be done in the event of an emergency. And I had the watch, and um, I was I had you know literally I had an old school beeper and a couple of cell phones. And my cell phone buzzes, the, the company phone buzzes, and I look down at the text message. It's been forwarded to me by the security operations center in Singapore, and it, it was forwarded by an employee that says, "Help! 
I've been shot in the stomach and I'm hiding behind some concrete planters. And I went, well, that's unusual. Why am I getting what looks like a, a crime in progress? And as I was looking at that and reaching for my phone to call Singapore, my beeper went off and it was another forwarded message that had come in by email and forwarded to my old school beeper. And it was from Hong Kong. And it was, and again, it was, uh, hey, I'm in, I'm in, um, I'm in Mumbai, and there's an explosion going off, and all the cops are dead. What do I do? And I went, huh, I looked at those two, and one person was at Taj Hotel, one was at the Oberoi, and I'm at Taj Oberoi. And I walked over in the operations center, and one of the things that I had done, that they had previously transitioned to all the digital maps. So they had all these fancy uh, glass panels, big flat glass panels with maps and, and ticker tape, electron ticker tape, and news reports and CNN playing in the background. But I'd insisted saying, hey, if you lose power, you got to have paper. So we had paper maps of all the cities where we had operations. And I flipped to the big paper charts, and I go to Mumbai, and I had all my staff mark, here's our authorized hotels, here's our trading floors, here are the major places where our people live, here's the major points of interest for tourists where our people might go to visit. And I put my finger on the Oberoi and the Taj. I looked at the map scale, and they're six miles apart. I went six miles apart, timestamps are a minute and a half apart. What are the odds of bombs and explosions and shooting at two hotels 90 seconds apart and six miles separated. That's got to be a terrorist attack. And there's, there's, as we mentioned in a previous podcast, there's a gold, silver, bronze kind of response that we borrowed from Scotland Yard and from MI6, which has become sort of the global standard for how you characterize uh, industrial crises, gold, silver, bronze. And that basically determines whether the regional, like the city staff respond, the regional staff, you know, all of the Pacific or the global staff, the actual chief executive officer and the main officers of the bank respond. And I initiated a, an emergency call that immediately interrupts everybody's day throughout the bank that has a role to respond and brings them to the phone and nowhere else to begin the process of responding to this. Um, and that was, on, that was on the basis of looking at these two things that were separated and saying, hmm, there's, there's no way this is anything but a terrorist attack. And certainly five minutes later on the phone, when the first person says, there's nothing on the news and nothing on the Internet, what are you, what are you bothering us for? I said, we have, we're ahead of the curve. We have early information. Use this time now to guide our response before it becomes the, the topic du jour. We have half an hour to an hour before this is well behind. Start now. And sure enough, this, is the, this became the Thanksgiving week, 2008, Mumbai terror attack that killed two or three hundred and wounded several hundred more, including a bunch of cops and army officers, and ended up with the eventual death of uh, all the terrorists. And my, my bank at the time had staff, not only in the city, several thousand staff, because they, they were domiciled there, but they also had several hundred travelers, because uh, a majority of European and American-based financial institutions have offshored their trading reconciliation business to India, because it's simply cheaper, and there's a large supply of of um, college-trained, highly educated, very savvy, but much less expensive uh, financial experts to use. And so that's where it's all done. But without that reconciliation, the training um, record for that day can't occur. And this is one of, those, one of those details that I tried to weave into the Valley of Shadow to illustrate how interconnected the world is. The fact that there's this fast-moving zombie virus has a lot more implications than just it's hard to buy groceries or you don't want to go pick up some gas. But the interconnectedness of our, our global financial institutions means that if someone catches a cold in Mumbai or Delhi or even, you know, or, or pick a place, a Shanghai, Beijing, Hong Kong, Tokyo, well, back in London and Frankfurt, you're going to start sneezing because you rely on those places for daily actually minute-to-minute -minute operations during the trading day. And that's just the reality of it. And that's how interconnected and interdependent we are. And that definitely informed how I wrote the book. And when I laid it out for John, he raises eyebrows and goes, like, really? We're that? Like, We're absolutely that dependent. And, um, and hopefully I was able to incorporate those details into the book uh, without the wall of text and the, you know, the extended exposition of how the financial system works. And just enough to make it believable yeah and real, but keep it entertaining and keep the plot moving. What a, a, a global director for intelligence or a regional director for security would do for a big bank, uh, as it also happens, I was, uh, I was part of the response team for the, the swine flu pandemic that happened the following year. Um, and there's a conversation 
that our protagonist has with the officers of the bank about the significance of the zombie virus. And he gets called on it like, look, we've had swine flu. It wasn't the end of the world. We've had avian flu. It wasn't the end of the world. Why do you want to spend all this money and jump through our fourth points of contact and react like it's the end of the world for this new virus that's going to probably blow over? And I, and I drew upon my, my firsthand experience to explain, look, you know, that disease had this characteristics that were bad, but we could mitigate. The second disease had a different set of bad characteristics, but we could mitigate. If you stick them together and you add maybe one more gotcha, it turns into a real mess. And I think that's where we're at, everybody. And so he's trying to persuade everybody to move with greater alacrity than the, uh, the colleagues in the novel want to move because it's, it's expensive. And it goes back to that theme of most people want to believe that the world's just going to go along and be okay, and it's all going to work out, and it's not really an emergency. There's, there's an aversion in human uh, psyche to not responding to an emergency if they can possibly help it, which is why you see people on the sidewalk in New York walking around and mugging and not paying attention because it's not their problem. Yeah. The, in, in the book, uh, it's when one of the security guys goes and gets infected and, and goes berserk that uh, it's sort of... It, gets everybody's mind concentrated on the problem. Yeah, it, it, it gets their attention. Oh, not only was there an infected guy, but this security bubba just killed him in front of us. Hmm, That's this right. is a new level of uh, of attention that I'm giving this now. Absolutely. And, yeah. um, That'll get you, know, you the, 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 the attention <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, and it, so one of the things that happened in the, in, in the, in the forward to the bank, I talk about how uh, there was a European bank whose chief executive was successfully assassinated, not just in Tampa, but actually killed him in the late 80s. And uh, it had a profound effect on that organization and on the country because he was so important. So that organization um, was required by that nation state's legislature to provide head of state level protection to their executives. In other words, carry guns. And so the, the notion that in an emergency uh, so very selected and a small number of people in a bank like that would be armed is actually based on personal experience. That actually is a true. That is true. That is real. What did you carry? Oh well, if, you know, if I were to work for an American firm, I'm sure they had me carry an American pistol. Um, I didn't work for an American firm, so I actually, uh, our security staff, let's say, carried uh, German-made firearms because that's how they roll. <laughs> there's a there, there's there's definitely a preference. I mean, a lot of the a lot of my colleagues were veterans of that country's military service, and so they had a preference. And so the selection of the of the firearm was driven by decisions made before I got there. And of course, once you have approval for firearms in a big metropolitan region like New York, everything's registered and numbered and serialized and permitted by the, the police department. So once you have a certain brand or a certain model. You're going to have that for a long time before you go through the bureaucratic nightmare of, of you know, refreshing your firearm selection. So it's, whatever they have is what you're going to carry is the reality of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, one other thing I wanted to talk to you about is the uh, um, this great little uh, short story novella that, that we have published that's related to um, The Valley of Shadows, um, which is called, uh, what's the title again, The Sea of... Sea of Darkness, yes, uh, and it's not, it's sea as in a papal, a cardinal sea, right? Of the... Right, the Holy Sea, yeah. So it, talk about that a little bit, just sort of set it up. We won't, we don't want to give it away or anything, but uh, it's really fun, and it's got a lots of, uh, it, it has a lot of action in it. If you like killing zombies, this is a good one to go for. I do. It's, there, there certainly is a, a, a not inconsiderable body count in this. But in, in much the same way that survivors learn that um, zombies do represent a potentially existential threat, uh, the greatest threat to survivors is often from other survivors. And the Vatican is no exception to this rule. So I won't be giving anything away if I if I reveal that at the very start of the story, um, which takes place from the point of view of a mid-level officer in something called the Swiss Pontifical Guard, which is a formed and recognized military unit 
operated by the Holy See in Vatican City that has both a ceremonial purpose. They wear um, they wear uniforms that harken all the way back to their founding uh, back in the 17th century in the 1600s. So it's a very fancy uh, scarlet and blue uniform with a, um, a a steel helm and steel breastplates and halberds. And you often see these these uh, very photogenic um, soldiers, but they are very much soldiers. In fact, the requirement to become a member of the Pontifical Swiss Guard is that you are a Catholic and B, you're a veteran of the Swiss military. And you speak either um, uh, Swiss French or Swiss German, and then you learn Italian, which is the, which is the working language of the, um, of the Swiss Guard. And I wondered what would happen in Vatican City, which was originally built, in fact, as a fort. That's why there's a huge wall around three-quarters of it, other than on the entrance to St. Peter's Basilica and St. Peter's Square, there's, where there's a tremendous open area, everything else is you know, anywhere from a 15-foot to a 50-foot sheer escarpment. And so it's a natural fortification once you, take, once you address this open corner on the, on the western side. And um, I needed this, this junior officer to not be the, the man in charge, but he had to be sort of a remnant of a forlorn hope. And I set it up that um, His Holiness, uh, the Pope, objected to, on moral grounds, the use of vaccine manufactured from the spines reclaimed from the human victims of the plague, that there was a moral peril to using this vaccine. And so he said, if Catholics aren't going to use this vaccine, he didn't use the vaccine. The very first thing that happens is he's infected and he has to be, um, so we say, sent to the great pearly gates in the sky. And of course, this has a knock-on effect on the security staff who are also unvaccinated and they just had to dispose of their principal, what do you do about that? How do you respond to that? And then, you know, the, the moral problems begin piling up one after the other. But um, in my research, I discovered that about this time in real life, there was a very senior member of the College of Cardinals who was sort of the consigliere, if you will, for the Pope. He's called the Cardinal Camerlengo. And the Cardinal Camerlengo is unique amongst all the cardinals in the College of Cardinals because he alone is not allowed to vote. He is the person that tabulates the votes. And he doesn't have any power other than a sort of an advisor, except when the Pope dies. And while the Pope is dying, whether in a papal interregnum, there's no Pope, he wields plenipotentiary power. He is the, the chief sovereign for a brief period. And it can last anywhere from you know, hours to days. There was a period way back in, the, way back in history where it lasted years because of the political machinations um, uh, in Vatican City back when it was almost an imperial power, uh, pre Lateran Treaty, pre-1917, pre pre-1919. And uh, this Cardinal Camelango is a Cistercian monk, which means he is very much not a member of what I will characterize as a, a subset of cardinals who are part of the perfume princes of the church who wear the fancy clothes and enjoy the privilege and, and the trappings in office. And those cardinals very much do exist. Uh, it, it only takes a modicum of effort to find the first-hand research that you can read that outlines in contemporary times right now that there are very much cardinals like that. And um, that sets up a, a couple interesting conflicts where the zombies are very much relevant, but they're not the principal threat. And so how does this man of conscience, this man of God, this soldier of, of, of Christ, how is he going to respond? And I, and I, like any good author, I place my my protagonist in an impossible situation, and let's see what happens. Uh, the universe is not over. We have, uh, we have another novel coming out next year, and there are currently plans for three further John Ringo Helms novels in that universe, um, which will explore conditions in other parts of the world uh, outside the United States as well as within other parts of the United States or the former United States. Um, and they take place at different places during the fall. So where uh, the Valley of Shadows is basically the first three and a half months from, you know, patient zero, if you will, uh, these take place uh, across a longer span of time. And so it'll give fans of the series an opportunity both to look at, you know, a narrow interval and sort of a microcosm as well as the larger span of time, what's happening. And I'm hopeful um, there will be further collaboration and we'll see more of faith and Sophia 
and Steve Smith uh, and their adventures on the uh, East Coast of the United States as they try to reclaim uh, the capital. A couple of John's shorts that he released um, have pointed to, you know, what's how how is reconstituting the United States government going? You know, what's going to happen to the the people that we left in the hole? We don't have vaccine. How are we going to use those sub crews, those skilled engineers? Now that there's a vaccine for them, all kinds of interesting threads that we're pulling on, and and hope to continue to bring this series alive for the readers. So we do have a sequel coming up. Um, where might uh, where where might we be going? Um, what, what's the name of that book again? Um, we were trying to decide whether it started with an article or not the other day. Uh, so my my operating belief right now is that it's A River of Night is a sequel to Valley of Shadows. Uh, it is um, it's what happens ashore after the fall of New York and where our uh, where our protagonist finds themselves. Um, and, you know, they've they've done a lot of preparation. You know, one of the one of the plans that you, you read about in the book is this this plan that Dom has created for the bank for how we're going to keep operating even when things are at their absolute worst. And how are you know how are we going to survive the hope what they hope will be the short term fall of civilization? The thing about that is that all the smart people in the world and the wealth and the people in the world aren't limited to banks. There's other folks. There, there will be other survivors. And they will likely uh, not share the same vision of the future that Tom and his, uh, we'll call them, um, corporate refugees might have. And so that sets up an interesting uh, clash of visions that's going to have to get resolved uh, before meaningful work, meaningful progress can take place on you know, resuscitating operations ashore. And uh, my long-term vision uh, to be discussed and agreed to with John and, and of course, with, uh, with Tony and yourself, is um, this story can very naturally uh, be extended and link up at some point with our heroes, our protagonists from the first four books, um, whom we last see uh, beginning, to reconquest, beginning a reconquest, a pacification, if you will, of um, a large part of the southeastern seaboard of the United States, parts of the Caribbean, uh, a small bit of London, obviously Guantanamo Bay, and a few other places as well. And so at some point, our, um, our uh, protagonists are going to have a chance to all meet. And I'm looking forward to that, and we'll see if uh, we'll see other readers want to see that too, and that'll, that'll drive our, uh, our decision process. So if you want yeah, to uh, that'll be... if you want to see how this all goes, you've got to buy the books. Yeah, and it's just the how it goes there is really cool. Um, do there we have another Black Tide Rising anthology coming out in the fall, um, I believe. Um, do you have a story in there? Um, and it's uh, it's going to take up. It's called Voices of the Fall, and it's going to take up where Black Tide Rising left off. There'll be uh, some of the same authors uh, from before, as well as some new faces uh, to the series. And uh, including one uh, one very notable author, I'll let, you, I'll let you. I think John's already announced that, but he's a he's a very big name uh, international thriller writer. Um, and uh, I think that's scheduled for spring of nineteen, or is that also summer of nineteen? Do yes, you know offhand? Is. No, no, it's spring. It's uh, okay, I super. It's so, April book. Voices of the Fall. I, I, you know, if uh, past history is any guide, the ER for that will be probably early early spring, late. Yes, it is. No, no, it's spring. It's, uh, I believe it's April book. <laughs> What's your story? I'm, I'm excited about my story in that because it's, uh, it's a departure from the, uh, the big muscly hero, uh, man of action notion. And it's, Oh, it might be before that. Just not that sort of decisive, uh, six foot tall, blue eyed Australian special operator hero. How are they going to survive? How are they going to get by? And, um, it's uh, it'll be interesting to see how uh, uh, fans of John's writing and people who've enjoyed my story so far uh, react to this sort of protagonist, and uh, we'll see how that yeah. pans out. Well, that'll be good because I can read it as a how-to then, because <laughs> I'm that guy. <laughs> I, hope, I hope not, but you never know. You never know. We'll see. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to feedback for that. Well, that'll be good because I can read it as a how-to then. Because I'm that guy. Planning for that at <laughs> Liberty Con 32 in Chattanooga, as well as at Dragon Con uh, 2019 there in Atlanta. Yeah, we're getting it. 
it's getting copy edited right now so um we uh will have i suspect uh end of november early december i bet we'll have that er ready to go um well that's when uh, john has uh john's currently editing the manuscript for river of night and directly he's done that'll go uh, into you guys and begin that process yeah we're looking forward to that we were um we were just looking at the uh, what what I was wondering was whether whether y'all wanted to put the t- the article on it since we we made it the Valley of Shadows. Um, whether you wanted to make the River of Night or River of Night. Um, in fact, we were going to ask you that. So I think uh, it's whatever uh, John and Tony and you decide on. I'm uh, I'm just happy to be yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you don't have a preference, huh? As some listeners may already know. Um, I had written uh, The Valley of Shadows, and the book was approaching a quarter million words, and uh, that was just a bit too long. And so we were told either edit that way down or turn it into two books. And turning it into two books is actually harder than it sounded because uh, we have to sort of reset the universe and the character introductions at the beginning of uh, the second novel, uh, as well as uh, really polish the uh, the climatic ending, if you will. And it's uh, one of the questions that's been asked over and over again is, what do you do about literally millions of zombies? How do you, how do you even cope with that? And so my characters are coming up with some potential solutions uh, that haven't occurred to Steve Smith with all of his uh, esoteric uh, killing machines out at sea. We've, uh, we've added an additional twist, if you will. And I don't, I don't want to give any more away at this point than that, but um I think fans will be entertained. That's very cool. Very cool. Well, the book out right now is The Valley of Shadows by John Ringo and Mike Mass. So that's part of the Black Tide Rising series, and it's now at booksellers everywhere. Well, Mike, thank you so much for uh, talking with us about The, the Valley of Shadows and uh, about working with John and about um, this great new addition to the series. Always a pleasure, Tony. It's great talking to you, and uh, I'll look forward to doing it again soon. That was the third part of an interview with Mike Massa talking about the Valley of Shadows. Part 1 and 2 are available on the previous week's podcast. Now we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa, book 1 in the saga of the Forgotten Warrior. After the War of the Gods, the demons were cast out and fell to the world. Mankind was nearly eradicated by the seemingly unstoppable beasts. Until the gods sent the great hero Ram Rowan to save them, he united the tribes, gave them magic, and drove the demons into the sea. But as centuries passed, the descendants of the great hero grew in number and power. They became tyrannical and cruel, and their religion nothing but an excuse for greed. The people rose up, and the surviving royalty and their priests were made castless, condemned to live as untouchables. The age of law had begun. Ashok Vidal has been chosen by a powerful ancient weapon to be its bearer. He is a protector, a member of an ancient military order of roving law enforcers. No one is more merciless in rooting out those who secretly practice the old ways as Ashok. But Ashok isn't who he thinks he is. And when he finds himself on the wrong side of the law, the consequences lead to rebellion, war, and perhaps transformation. Now here is the latest entry in Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. It has been a very long time since a great house has volunteered the service of the bearer of their ancestor blade to the protectors of the law. The last time that happened, impoverished Akershan's obligation died after a few years, but they gained the capital's gratitude for a generation. For mighty Vidal to give such a gift would be seen by the judges as an incredible act of devotion. Our foes will believe that we are so confident in our defenses that we do not even require the blade's presence. 
and Gruvedal exists to serve. And there is no honor greater than to dedicate a life to protecting the law. Everyone wins. Except me, the boy thought to himself. All he knew about protectors were that the non-people were taught from birth to never break the law, because then the protectors would come for them. The life of a protector is one of hardship and service, but it is not usually a long life, Javans mused. That is correct, Arbiter. Their lives tend to be glorious and brief. Their average member doesn't survive their obligation. Our only terms would be that when he is inevitably killed fulfilling his duty, the ancestor blade must be swiftly returned to its rightful house so that it may choose its next bearer. Then we can put this unfortunate incident behind us. The order is brutal. With any luck, he'll die in training. Chavan smiled. Yes. This course is honorable and brief. Foolishness, Harter declared. The law is clear on the separation of castes. What happens when the most ruthless of all its enforcers discover that we not only violated the law, but insulted them in the process by sending them this... this... farm animal? The wizard smiled. Perhaps it was the poppy, but the boy thought Kuhl's teeth were too sharp. I will make sure the boy tells them only what we wish him to. Your potions may be able to cloud the mind, but they can't pass a castless off as a whole man. Forgetting his earlier fear, Harter strode over to the boy. It probably helped that by now he was barely able to keep his eyes open, or his heavy head from drifting toward the cushions. Harter roughly put his hand on top of the boy's head and rubbed it around through his hair as if searching for something. Everyone knows castless have horns. That's only a myth, Chavin snapped. Did you not pay any attention in your studies? They are mentally defective savages, but they're still physically human. Embarrassed, Harter backed away, wiping his hand on his robe because he'd touched something filthy. They're still coarse and stupid. This charade will fool no one. Protectors are not known for their polite company, firstborn, but rather for their viciousness. A quality which castless have in abundance, Kuhl explained patiently. The Order will be so pleased at having access to an ancestor blade that they will overlook his limited intellect. The Dal encompasses a vast territory. I have no doubt we can find some backwoods inbred village for him to hail from. My scribes keep the Vidal genealogy, Chavan said. It can be arranged. Kuhl, satisfied that his nails were clean, stuck the talon back inside his sleeve. I assure you, grant me a bit of time and no one will ever suspect this little thing was not born a whole man. Very well, wizard. You had best not disappoint. Giving our best to the order. Only Vidal cares enough about the law to make such a sacrifice, Harter muttered. Yes, I could sell that in the capital. Let those Vokan monkey humpers try to suck up to the chief justices over our trade disputes after that. What of the boy, Kuhl? Medea asked. What of him, my lady? Can you truly make him believe he is one of us? Can you truly make something forget what it really is? The wizard was confident. It will take a great deal of effort and expense, but my art can obscure its memories and construct new ones in their place. I will give it a new foundation built upon a total devotion to the law. Upon that foundation, I will build a most obedient servant. Medea seemed intrigued. While you're at it, can you remove his fear? 
It will take some doing, my lady. Emotions are stamped upon us. Cutting one off may damage the others. May I ask why? I want my family sawed back as soon as possible. Ah, yes, of course. That is wise. The bold die first. I will erase his sense of fear. As for erasing the evidence of the rest of his existence, that is up to you. Very well, we will proceed with the wizard's plan. Chavans, how many others know of this? Six guards, mere Nayaks, so no one of rank sufficient to cause a scandal if they die. I saw to it that they were all confined to the palace and allowed no visitors. Excellent. Come up with a crime and execute them for it. Murder all the house slaves and their overseer as well. The boy protested. The house slaves had been kind and fed him. But his cries meant nothing to the first cast. Medea turned back to the boy. Do you have a family? He didn't want to answer, but the sleeping poppy made it so the words just fell out. I have a mother. You don't know who your father is? Of course not. Since the sword chose you, I'm assuming you're my dead husband's bastard. And all this time I thought he had better taste than to slum about with a fish-eater whore. Chavant, before you kill the overseer, have him take you to the castless quarter. Find the boy's mother and kill her. In fact, let us err on the side of caution. Find whatever slum he called home and burn it to the ground. Kill everyone he's ever known. Make it certain. It will be done, the old man assured her. Please don't, milady, the boy begged. I can keep a secret. This is for the best, child. Go to sleep now. Tomorrow will be a new day. Chapter 12 Ashok remembered the hands of a child, covered in blood. Now they were the hands of a man, hardened and trembling with barely controlled rage. The spell was broken. It was all coming back. This was it, the very place where the fraud had begun. Lies, slander. The crowd whispered about his allegations. Outrageous! They looked to the Thakur, but Bidea seemed incapable of responding. Ashok knew that the truth had momentarily robbed Bidea of her serpent's tongue. She should have known this day would come. Her silence was damning. The whispers began to change. Could it be? What does it mean? Born of an untouchable makes him untouchable. A castless bears our sword. What was her name? Ashok whispered. Medea mumbled something incomprehensible. This time he bellowed with all his might. What was her name? The mob flinched away. Why would I remember? Medea shouted her face flushed red. I don't remember the name of some wretched castless whore any more than I remember the name of the pigs we butchered for dinner. They're equally inconsequential. You were nothing. She was nothing. You were a whim of the sword. I made you, petulant child. You broke the law. Someone in the crowd charged. I saved this house. Medea screamed back. Then she realized she'd said too much and tried to compose herself, but it was too late. Face had been lost. Word would spread. I deny these charges. The protector has lost his mind. He's a foul liar. You wish to make this a legal matter, Ashok, then so be it. You wish a life for a life? Then, as the law allows, I demand a duel. Who among you has the courage to defend the honor of this house? Who will fight on my behalf? 
several young men of the warrior caste immediately stepped forward. Their volunteering forced some of the hesitant soldiers to action so they wouldn't lose face. They began to assemble in front of Bidea. Most were too naive to realize what they were facing. Some knew. They were aware of what an ancestor blade could do, threshing men as if it were a scythe and they were wheat. But they would willingly die for their master because that was what warriors do. I will have my restitution, Ashok warned. If she expected bloodshed to turn him aside, she was sorely mistaken. His anger would only be quenched when Badea was dead at his feet. I don't want to kill these men, but I will. Most of them were young, dressed in brilliant uniforms, and wearing commendations earned as a result of their station rather than their own skill. Yet there were a few among the perfumed peacocks that carried themselves like experienced combatants. One of them, wearing the uniform of the personal guard, raised his voice. If you wish us to commit suicide on your behalf, my lady, we shall gladly do so. But there is no such thing as a duel when an ancestor blade is involved. Only slaughter. Medea wore an evil smirk. Let the world say that the protector had gone mad, slaughtering warriors of his own house, men who'd broken no law, who had no chance against an invincible black steel weapon. Medea would surely die, but not before she'd preserved her name. Ashok was so furious that he thought about cutting them all down regardless. But he would give her nothing. You are wise, warrior. Ashok drew his sword. The group before him flinched. They could feel that it was eager to kill. Not today. Ashok lifted Angruvadal high, then slammed its points deep into the floor. The black steel penetrated the stone like it was soft wood. He let go and stepped away, leaving the sword there, upright and vibrating from the impact. Now it was fair. He walked over to his opponents, stopping when they were only a few paces apart. Half of them had already drawn their dress knives and were jittery with nerves. Who will contend with me? Ashok suspected it would be the fearsome bodyguard next to Bidea. That one looked eager enough. But Bidea put her hand on the giant to keep him in place, then looked over her prospective duelists. There were a dozen to choose from. Ashok could tell what she was thinking. Without the sword, a warrior had a chance to defeat him. If he died in combat, Angruvadal would be satisfied. She could still salvage this situation. Medea had already proven herself so dishonorable that her next words shouldn't have come as a surprise. All of them. My lady asked the same veteran as before, unsure at the command. This was an execution. She meant for the lies to die with him. You heard me, Jagdish. All of you. Those with integrity hesitated, torn by such a command. The rest rushed forward, eager to carry their Thakur's favor. A young warrior lunged, driving his dagger at Ashok's face, but the protector knocked his arm away. Another gave a wild swing at his midsection, but Ashok darted back. Then he had to move again to avoid another blade, and another. But even without Angruvadal in his hand, he retained much of its wisdom and had trained in the fighting arts of the protector order, where Ratul had allowed him no crutch. Ashok flowed like water between his foes, he swatted aside an arm, then slammed his elbow into that warrior's chest, knocking him down. Another stabbed at him recklessly, but Ashok caught him by the wrist and twisted, throwing him off balance, and used his momentum to snap bones. The warrior cried out in pain as Ashok spun him about and flung him into his allies. They were coming from every direction. A cut was directed at his back, but Ashok was too fast. He stepped into it, caught the arm, locked up on the elbow, and ground that joint into fragments. Then he dragged the arm back up and put the warrior precariously beyond his center of gravity, 
The others were still attacking, so he twisted the arm harder, steered the warrior between his body and danger, and dragged his meat shield toward the center of the dance floor. Many guests were fleeing, but others remained to watch the spectacle. Ashok observed his opponents. The inexperienced were getting in each other's way, tripping each other up. The careful were flanking, looking for their moment. Ashok twisted the arm harder, and the boy screamed. The reactions of his opponents told a story. Those who cringed were vulnerable. Intimidation made them afraid. Fear made them clumsy. That took care of most of them. Only one of them had a face as expressionless as Ashok's. He made eye contact with that veteran. Then he ripped the captive warrior's knife from sudden nerveless fingers and plunged it into its owner's throat. He dropped the gurgling, choking warrior to drown in his own blood. Ashok held up the bloody weapon as if to say, now I have a knife. That was sufficient to strike fear into a few more of them. To their credit, most didn't hesitate. The warriors came at him in a rush. The veteran tagged him in the side, but not deep enough to strike his vitals. The ceremonial blades were short, but they were kept razor sharp. He met them, clashing, striking, then moving aside, but always slicing. Ashok was calm. There was only action, reaction, and blood pressure. An arm wasn't withdrawn fast enough, so Ashok split it open from wrist to elbow. Realizing the protector was too fast to trade blow for blow, a warrior tried to tackle him, but Ashok drove the dagger into that one's thigh. When he ripped it out, a bright spray of femoral blood drenched the floor. He caught another arm and leveraged it around, stabbing that warrior repeatedly in the chest before dropping him into the puddle. There was a burning sensation as a steel edge parted the muscles of his back. Ashok dove between them, rolling across the stone, palm, forearm, shoulder, and then springing instantly back to his feet, facing his attackers. He split a kidney in half, then stepped on the back of a knee to force the warrior down to have his throat slashed. Kicking that one between the shoulder blades caused the body to fall forward and trip up an advancing ally. That distraction gave Ashok the time he needed to put three fast puncture wounds into that attacker's torso. That was over half of them dead, severely injured, or crippled and moaning on the floor. The remaining warriors came at him, trying to entangle him. If he became immobile, he would die. They fought across the hall, fainting, striking, constantly moving. Ashok was cut again on the chest. He was kicked in the leg. While blocking a knife thrust, a fist caught him in the eye. He opened that warrior's stomach. Rolling round another, he opened that one's armpit, but lost the unfamiliar knife when the blade stuck in a rib and the slick handle slid from his grasp. Ashok backed into a table. It was a failure of awareness. Luxurious food fell off the table and plates and glasses shattered. A wounded man sacrificed himself by throwing his body against Ashok. The sudden impact caused the table to collapse. As the rest closed on them, Ashok rolled through the food and blood and broken glass, spied a large two-tined meat fork, and picked it up. The warrior grabbed him by the leg to keep him in place, but Ashok stabbed the fork through his hand and pinned his palm to the floor. Now, there were only three. When I wake up, well, I know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the man who wakes up next to you. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a special reprieve from the upcoming Gobble of Doom from the Apocalypse Turkey, bringing on the end of the Christmas season as we know it, so that he can continue his secret work making Santa's workshop secure against cyber attack. And thanks, praise, and huzzas for Mike Massa, co-author with John Ringo of The Valley of Shadows. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. Keep